Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia, and today is the launch of patch 1.1 for Total War Warhammer 3, and we're going to be doing a quick patch rundown. Now this patch is huge, so it will take us a little bit of time, but we'll try to skip all the boring stuff and talk about the important changes here. So first things first, we have the game stability and performance changes. These are all things that's causing different type of crashes, and these are the few that are fixed. There are still a couple of soft locks that's mentioned in the end uh, with certain things that are tested. And I'm sure with all patches, there's going to be a few things that breaks and require further patching, and that's fine. But the main thing here is the alt tabbing. Whenever you switch out of your screen, it crashes the game. This one's super annoying for someone like myself who records the game, since I have to basically alt tab to use the recording software. Not cool, but now it's fixed. Never had an issue with a caravan but apparently there was a crash with that, as well as heroes moving into army, merging with each other, and so forth. So we're not going to go through all the details. Basically, a couple of crashes got fixed. We have some graphic issues with vegetation appearing darker, flickering. Now, about flickering, I'm sure it's not mentioned here because it rarely comes up, but I do know that the Dwarven uh, gyrocopters, when you select them, sometimes could have the white flickering from the blade on the screen as well, something that I reported to them. So hopefully we'll see a fix in the future. Uh, not often you get to use gyrocopters unless you have sort of alliance uh, with the Dwarven factions to be able to pick up their units or to borrow one of their armies. There's also a couple of different texture issues with the Zinch Realm that is fixed. Audio improvement, this is not really a bug per se, uh, lead belchers, iron blasters now sound more like a cannon instead of just a gun to reflect the weapon that they actually use. There's a couple UI changes, nothing huge, missing icons, and so forth. Now let's jump to gameplay. Now this is the meat of things. Uh, corrupted trait. This one is super annoying. These are the trait you pick up on the campaign map when you're in a province with high corruption of a certain type, and it could be corrupted by... For example, Nurgle's the 5% replenishment trait, terrible trait. And previously, what was going on is if you want to remove this trait, not only do you have to spend time in a province with pretty much zero level of that particular corruption, it needed to have zero levels of all corruption. So if I had a corrupted Nurgle trait and I'm in a province that has zero Nurgle corruption, but somehow undivided, corruption is 100% or just high, I will never be able to remove the trait. So now it's just dealing with whichever corrupted by, you know, insert your chaos god. And as long as that corruption level is low, which I still assume would be zero, because I had picked up this trait with like 22% corruption uh, before. So I'm assuming if it's zero, you can get rid of it a bit faster. It just has to be that type of corruption removed. It doesn't have to be a clean province. So it helps, helps a little. And then there are other gameplay fixes. I think most of these are supposed to be fixes to things that should work, but wasn't working. For example, um, the everlasting gift wasn't giving the correct amount of bonuses. Now it is supply line was not being updated when you disbanded a lord, it still assumed you had it, and then when you resummoned it, you got another 4% if you're on legendary. So these are things that should be working in a certain way, but not, so it's now fixed to reflect how they're properly designed. Uh, dockable area with range units shooting arcs getting fixed, and so forth. So these are not so important. So if there are things that should work previously in the game, it was not changed, it was just bugged out, now it's fixed. Now, one thing about auto-resolve, so CA is continuing their work on auto-resolve because it's not working as intended and everyone can tell. Basically, the auto-resolve values are terrible. What was fixed with this patch, nothing huge. Uh, essentially, what happened is if you have a settlement army and you are delegating that, uh, the outcome basically favored the settlement side depending on whether you're getting attacked or you're attacking. Uh, and that just doesn't feel right because it's the same exact army and that's been fixed. But auto resolve has not been fixed yet. Uh, it will get fixed in a future patch, which is mentioned at the very bottom. We'll get to it. 
Aside from that, um, there is a wind magic bug where you can generate infinite amount because of a rounding error that's been fixed. Uh, Bellacore's skill tree is fixed to correctly reflect what skill is being unlocked. And we have a few issues with battle speed slowing down in replays. So all these things are things that should have worked based on whatever description was in the original design. It wasn't working. Now it's fixed. Um, moving on to campaign. So prologue, I don't think we want to mention too much about prologue. It was basically a couple of bug issues that some players might run into like a soft lock where they can't progress. And um, we're basically going to skip through this. Realm of Chaos, this is where the first meat of the change comes from. A lot of people are not fans of the Soul Race. Uh, looking at my own campaign on the channel, I have been ignoring the Realm of Chaos entirely and uh, pretty much not a huge fan of it either, uh, but it's fine. I think for a first experience, it's pretty cool, but repeatedly doing it and being forced to uh, chase souls is not very fun. A couple big changes, negative traits you pick up in the realm of chaos is reduced by 50% effectiveness. This will help mitigate some of the negative effects. You will also never pick up a negative trait of your own chaos god. So Scarbrand would never pick up a core negative trait for being in the corn realm, for example. Just things that make logical sense. Also, when you finish the survival battle within the realm, whatever negative traits you picked up in that realm will be cleaned up. This is pretty nice, basically a small reward, so you don't have to pay a heavy cost to finish up a realm, and also discourages players from repeatedly going to Slaanesh's realm to pick up gifts, or at least you have to pay a price of picking up this negative trait that you don't get to remove because you were tempted and left the faction with the reward. And in addition to that, this is the super annoying one, where you wound the enemy AI faction that has four souls, when they go to Forge of Souls before you, you knock them out for 15 turns for being wounded. Previously, they weren't even knocked out for 15 turns. I think it was only the standard five turns, which was super annoying because they just go back again. Now, not only are they wounded for 15 turns, or rather, rather than being wounded for 15 turns, they just lose all their souls and they have to start collecting again. So this buys you a lot of time. That's close to 100 turns or so, depending on how fast these... A portal come up it's a bit random between like 20 to 30 turns so roughly 100 turns of time and you don't really have to worry about that ai faction again so that's really nice uh, but they also made a small change i don't think it's listed here where you can't replace your legendary lord when you do the intercept previously you could just have your legendary lord well they're the only one who could intercept but once they're there you could swap them out for a regular lord and have them basically ambushed at the Forge of Souls, intercepting everyone that's coming. Now there's really no need to do that because you will take all their soul away. So uh, you don't gain the soul. You basically make sure they lose them. And that's that's enough to buy you enough time uh, to play the game as you wish before you do your own uh, Forge of Soul attempt. Uh, they're the protection building chain, the one that gives the lookout basically for every faction. Uh, this can prevent rifts from spawning in the province where they're built. So you don't have to have heroes running around closing portals every 25 turns. You have to give up a protection slot uh, for the building, but it protects the whole province. So it's not bad. In addition to that, there is rewards added to winning that survival battle. Not only do you get a soul, you get 10 turns of bonuses, 8 points of growth, 15 uh, eight, 15 points of growth, 8 points of control, 10% income for all provinces, and typically minus 5 corruption unless you went to sort of your own chaos gods uh, realm and you beat them. Then you get plus 5 because you want to spread your chaos for the great game. So there is a little bit of flexibility in here for the chaos factions, but if you're not playing as that chaos faction, it's minus 5 for everyone else. And this kind of encouraged players to maybe attempt these survival battles a bit earlier because these are substantial rewards. Um, so pretty nice to uh, bolster your campaign after coming out from a realm. In addition to that, there are adjustments to the bonuses you get inside the realm, namely Zinch and Nurgle's realm. There are points of interest. So these are dilemmas where you pick options. Now all the boon uh, options are listed so you can see exactly where you're getting. And you're also going to get full replenishment for every single option. So that basically makes the realm a bit easier. So that's nice. Also, here's where you can't replace the Legendary Lord. We mentioned this already. 
and there's a rare issue where you close the riff. Um, yeah, I think some player did mention this where they get bugged out for the final fight, but that's been fixed. Lastly, the reward for the Forge of Soul fight, Bellacor. Um, so it doesn't make sense for non-Chaos factions to pick up Bellacor since he's the standard reward. So logically, they added the option to banish him instead, and you'll receive sort of an end game permanent benefit for the entire faction where all heroes will get plus three um, capacity. 14 rank bonus for lord and heroes. This one's massive. Uh, five points of wins of magic per turn for all armies, also massive. Plus seven points control, 25 growth, 15% income. And these are all forever bonuses. So the reward is quite huge and perhaps if you can play the campaign as designed you can go for sort of a realm of chaos first into a domination a paint the map style where you get all these bonuses to assist you so that should be very beneficial instead of picking up bellacore if you feel like the story doesn't add up and speaking of bellacore he did get a few changes to his uh, starting trait and his abilities to kind of work as designed previously i think it was mentioned earlier this is just stating exactly what got fixed the shadow shroud in addition to that continuing to records would replay the voice line that's a small bug issue with the wrong voice line playing and then we have the bulk of this patch note it's long it's like 20 pages long because most of it is demons of chaos aka daniel um, who is getting buffs and some adjustments so he's seen as a little bit too weak as a legendary lord so his base stat on the character without any of his upgrades and parts are getting a huge boost. So you're seeing 25 points to melee attack. So 25% additional hit rate. Very, very good. 25% to basically his evasion numbers, if you think about it, with melee defense. Damage goes up by 25. Not huge. Armor piercing goes up by 25. I mean, something. And you get 10 points of armor. So effectively, you're getting like 7.5% less damage reduction uh, against... Uh, base damage and then charge bonus gets a nice little 10 point add uh, to it to reflect these early game stat boost on the character itself the first set of body parts that you get are getting nerfed because you're already getting the stat on yourself so this is the only set that's sort of nerfed you can see the torso uh, the left arm the right arm the leg and the tail are getting um basically stuff removed from them. The weapons are still getting a buff. So 5% additional damage. Uh, so these are nice. Aside from this initial set, oh, all the offering, I was gonna talk about all the other parts cause that's all getting buffed. We'll talk about that soon. Uh, the offerings all getting some sort of buff in the late game. So if you're going the undivided route, you're getting a lot of different bonuses to makes sense for the late game. Basically, it feels too weak right now. So the offering eight, you're getting the plus 10 rank instead of plus three for agents and lords. Um, dedicated units recruitment time by two turns reduction. There is a couple of things that they did take out, like the 10% casualty replenishment for corn. It's really not needed for the blood. It's just too much. Uh, you get additional 25% campaign movement range. Lovely. And uh, you don't have building cost reduction bonuses for Nurgle anymore, but you do get 20% global replenishment bonus to Nurgle units. Pretty huge. I mean, they're basically playing up to each of the gods kind of play style, you know, repeated battles to continue your movement range, having a good amount of replenishment rate on your units and so forth. Uh, diplomacy going up for Slanesh. Um, they did remove the chance of Winds of Magic for Zinch. Um, this is interesting because I think Zinch is getting a nerf overall to a couple of mechanics in this patch and this kind of plays up to it, but uh, it's basically getting changed slightly to a percentage one on the chance of increasing the strength and so forth. And then all god, uh, the units get three additional rank for the late game. It means offering nigh already, so not a big deal. Uh, it's nice to have. Obviously not going to complain about that. Then comes all the sets. We're not going to go over all of them, but essentially all the sets, I mean, there's bugs. It's been fixed a little. Uh, they're getting buffs, right? Look at all these numbers. We have pages and pages of different body parts getting buffed. Small buffs, usually three points, 3% 3 or so, sometimes two points, um, but it's buffs across the board to make Daniel a little bit stronger. 
uh, as people have been complaining about his power level in terms of fighting other lords. And we're going to skip through the bulk of this patch note, which is just detailing how much of a bonus you get from each one. There is the general fixes. This is probably more important. Uh, this really sucked. If you complete the Forge of Souls, yet Rifts still reopen the world, that's been fixed. And Boris not creating a new faction or not appearing in your recruitment pool after finishing his uh, Frozen Fall quest. So now Boris is going to always show up in game, hopefully, and uh, hopefully you recruit him. Then for battles. So there are quite a bit of change and there's going to be more work needed. First thing is spells. And spells got a big change between 2 and 3, which was ready um, sort of shared knowledge about how damage reduction doesn't happen anymore over distance, which made a lot of spells that take place in a big area feel a lot stronger in three. In particular, Pendulum. Pendulum was really, really hard to deal with. Uh, it was dealing 72 damage. It's been reduced to half. The armor piercing percentage remains the same at 50%. This is a huge nerf, deserving so, I think. I think Pendulum was way too strong. Uh, the shape is like basically perfect for a cluster of infantry. Um, you just basically wipe them out in one hit. The overcast is receiving a huge nerf as well. It was 108 when you overcast from the 72 and the percentage of armor piercing goes up to 66%. Now it's basically going from the 36 value to 45. The armor piercing does go up at 10%, but you can see the drop off of the previous overcast version of 108 to now just 45. So this feels terrible, um, but in relations to their base, I pref I like it because I don't personally like to overcast. So I feel like this makes the base relatively stronger. Uh, you're only getting about a 25% boost in terms of damage and 10% armor piercing on top of that. So maybe like 28% improvement previously. It was a 50% improvement plus a 16% armor piercing. So it's like a huge improvement for the overcast. Now it's just not really worth it. Unit responsiveness. So this is a terrible issue that players have been dealing with, not only with range units turning when you uh, manually pick out target for them, but also infantry's sometimes slow to react to orders or sometimes locking themselves in guard mode. This was issue with locked control groups that just sort of enter guard mode when getting attack order, which really sucked because the new guard mode is like super sticky. Your units would like just not move, but that's been sort of fixed. I think they'll continue to work on this in the future. Um, it's been improved. So I don't know if it's um, fixed. I think it definitely has more room for improvement. Range units to fire slower when docked. This is something that was hinted earlier. This is now fixed and the reset animation. Um, this is not something to do with turning speed per se. I think turning speed is still being played around with um, by the developers to see how exactly to fix that. In general, it should feel better than before, but probably not up to par. Uh, infantry will feel like Warhammer 2, so I think a lot of people will like that. But range, I think, will still need some work. And as you can see, there's still a handful of issues they're hoping to resolve in future updates. And that includes the airborne unit transition to ground, how units disengage from combat, knockdown behavior, which has a lot to do with mass, uh, which I think is coming up. General fixes, charge reflect was previously applied to all units, regardless of whether they're braced or not. As long as you were getting charge, you got charge reflect. That's been fixed. And that should probably make um, peasant law spearmen seem less godly, but uh, definitely fair. You want to be braced to pick this up. Yeah, you shouldn't just have it when you get charged. This was the main issue. Uh, the defending unit was using the attacking unit's mass rather than their own for calculating the impact damage. Um, so this is probably just a coding error. Somebody copied uh, the mass figures and just used the wrong mass. And this is probably one reason why cavalry suck. Not sure if it will improve it to the point of Three Kingdoms. That's just a different charge bonus calculation. Like the charge bonus in Three Kingdoms is just massive compared to what you see in Warhammer. But in general, this should help because, you know, if you're charging Nobblers, they should not be able to withstand it. Basically, the impact damage will go way up against them because they will have way less mass because they're not using your own mass for the calculation. So that's a very nice fix. 
Fixed issue were attacking reinforcement would enter from within the Defender City. There were some really bad reinforcement zones, like right next to the Victory Flag. That's been fixed. Also, reinforcements should correctly enter a battle according to the position on the campaign map. In Domination and Survival Battles, summon units will no longer offer a refund after being teleported away from battlefield. So this is kind of interesting. So you can have like a Herald of Corn summon um, Chaos Spheres or Hounds, and then you could teleport them away and get a refund for the value. Uh, quite a cheese for Domination and Survival Battles. That's been fixed. And for factions, individual faction changes. So general fixes for Exalted Lord of Change have access to Greater uh, Arcane Conduit. I think this has been a pretty big complaint online. Um, I haven't played much Siege myself, so can't really offer a lot of insight to that. But this definitely is crucial for such a spell-heavy faction such as Siege. Ogre Kingdoms, they need nerfs and they're getting them. So Iron Blaster, super, super strong. They were way too accurate with the spread of the projectile. They're designed to be sort of a mobile shotgun, hoping to flank with their speed and then just shoot a sort of shotgun feel attack against the length of the infantry unit. So now the change is being pushed for that. Uh, the spread has gone up from three to seven. Um, this should definitely help with not having this unit be a mobile sniper uh, because it was, you probably needed two iron blasters it, at least in domination, and you can just pick off a sky junk from far away before the sky junk can even move into you because your shots are just so deadly accurate at max range that um, things like sky junk had no chance, and that should be fixed. So basically, against single entities, less effective, still great weapon against clusters infantry. The damage has been reduced a little bit, 84 to 75, and the armor piercing uh, damage done by each projectile has gone down a little bit from 336 to 300. So just a nerf on the Iron Blaster. It still has good traits, like it's still really fast. It still can charge into a thing like a chariot. It survives, has good health, good speed, and uh, still decent damage. Gorgers, um, definitely a bit strong just because they are unbreakable. They're super fast. All the Ogre units are just very fast. And the nerf that they're doing for this is they're reducing the armor piercing damage from 70 to 50, and they're changing the entity count, which I have mixed feelings about. So this obviously is a nerf going from 16 to 12. Each individual Gorger unit will have more health because you're not changing the health pool, but you only have 12 Gorgers doing damage now, right? So if it was like 70 before for the armor piercing damage, if we just look at armor piercing damage, it's 70 times 16 technically in terms of like how much damage you're doing right now it's going to 50 times 12 so the damage figure on gorger is going to go way down right they're going to be greater at harassing units and like holding them in place because you're kind of unbreakable but aside from that your damage is going way down so that kind of sucked for them um but they were a little too good so uh, these two have like changes due to sort of a mix between campaign and domination multiplayer because these two are sort of the go-to units in multiplayer given their value. And then this is a pretty big one, Firebelly Heroes, which is a default garrison for Ogre Kingdom factions, uh, did not have spells, and now they do. Uh, multiplayer, right? So we're getting separate changes, but not in terms of stats. So for multiplayer, it's more about valuation to make them better just by making them cheaper or more expensive. In this case, iron bl uh, blasters are going to 1750, a pretty big cost jump, but a fair one because this is way too cheap. I think we looked at this uh, when it was launched and it was just too good. And now uh, ogre giants will count a single entity uh, for the sake of unit caps, uh, basically how many units you can have of a certain type. Uh, this is... Minor issue, uh, especially if you're a campaign player like myself. Grand Cathay, um, struggling the most in domination online mode and the unit that were just basically not being utilized that much in campaign as well. Sky Junk, Sky Lantern, Wuxing War Compass. I agree with Sky Lantern and Wuxing War Compass. Sky Junk is godly. I don't know why anyone would ever complain about them, but um, we're getting changes to them uh, or buffs. So this is welcomed. Harmony Range. 
massive change. We're going from 45 meter effective radius for harmony effect to 60. This is actually quite large because you have to think about radius effect is sort of a linear measurement, but harmony is getting measured in area, right? So for example, if you have 45 as your radius, that's, um, you know, uh, 20, 25 times pi, whatever you want to do the meter calculation, uh, calculation. So it's like 2025, right? You square the radius. Now we're going to basically 3,600, right? Times pi. So if you just do the ratio, we're getting more than the 50% increase um, in terms of how large uh, the radius is. So that's actually pretty massive. Like if you just look at the linear number, it doesn't feel that much. It's like 33% here, but the area change is actually like more than 50%. So you're going to be able to fit a lot more units for the radius effect. Um, Harmony is just going to feel stronger for both campaign and for domination. Um, it's a funny change because I think this is influenced more heavily by the multiplayer side than the campaign side, uh, since you're basically boxing up in campaign most of the time with Grand Cathay units. Uh, but it's a nice, nice change, I guess. Sky Junks. We're getting more ammo on Sky Junk. I don't know if they need more ammo, um, especially with manual aiming, but. Um, Awesome change. I guess if you're playing as Zhao Ming, this is great because you don't get all the nice ammo bonuses that Mel Ying's faction receive. So um, you have a decent amount of ammo to start with. Sky Junk Bomb. Uh, cooldown reduced to 30 seconds. This is a great change because oftentimes, because the cooldown is so long, I just end up not using it at all, especially given how slow Sky Junks are. Um, but these two things kind of work against each other. Like, preferably, you want your Sky Junk to be firing. It does more damage, especially if you get manual fire across the front line. So kind of, if you can shoot with pinpoint accuracy, Sky Junk Bomb, not so attractive. Especially if you have to slowly fly over and then fly back to a position where you can shoot at those units. So basically, this is sort of like a last resort when you're kind of out of ammo. You go around and drop your bombs. I guess it's fine. I mean, a buff is a buff. Sky Lantern, very interesting chain. They're trying to differentiate between Sky Lantern and Sky Junk, even though the key thing is you have a bigger platform on the Junk, and thus uh, you have a Fire Ring rocket mounted on there, plus the Sky Junk bomb. You don't have that on Sky Lantern, but you still have the same technically for uh, Crane Gunners. But now these Crane Gunners are going to get a Shield Breaker effect only on the Sky Lantern ones. The Sky Junk ones will not get this. Um, I believe Shield Breaker reduces the enemy like range block chance by like 35%. So it's, it's pretty good. Um, it's not bad. And the speed goes up to 35. So this is sort of a fair change because they're both slow. But if you have a you know Fire Ring rocket mounted below you and carrying three extra bombs, you should be slower. So instead of nerfing the speed on this, which is already too slow, we're getting a buff to the speed on the Sky Lantern. Is it viable now? Not really. I, I wouldn't bring one of these. Um, it's a good harmony multiplier, I guess, in a sense, especially with a new radius increase. So I'm assuming the amplifier radius should also increase, right? That would only make sense. So Sky Lanterns are great for that, but I will probably still just bring the Sky Junk wherever I could bring the Sky Lantern. If I'm looking for Shield Breaker, I'll just get the Crane Gunners, right? All right, we get a fix for the skill, uh, the skill, not, yeah, we'll guess the skill tree, right, of characters, the boosting unit one, Stone Gaze. It was previously giving leadership for Terracotta Sentinels and Wuxing War Compass units, which doesn't make sense for the Terracotta Sentinel part because they're unbreakable. So now they're getting an increase in armor instead, uh, which makes the skill better uh, just across the board. Instead of having one half of it being wasted, now it's just actually useful. Multiplier changes. So this obviously comes down to cost. Uh, Wuxing War Compass getting reduced cost by 300. Is it good? It's okay. Um, if you're trying to spam spells in Domination Multiplayer, having a compass around uh, to kind of boost your intensity of spells, not bad. Um, adding the mount reduced to... Well, that's huge. Just get this. The unit's still not going to get played. Just get the Astromancer... With only, you know, you're saving 550 and you're getting the mount. So, yeah. Lastly, the harmony bonus. Oh, this is just a small cost change to the cheapest range unit. Since you're going to be heavily using 
sentinels, I'm assuming, for multiplayer, maybe some uh, cheap peasant long spearmen. Having some sort of cheap available range unit to just activate the harmony bonus is crucial. So going 50 less on the peasant archer, not bad. Uh, they don't do much damage. There's just very high base damage. Not Well, not even high base damage, but very low armor piercing damage. Uh, but there's like 100... I want to say 160 in the unit, maybe 120, um, but it's a good number, so uh, it's nice to have. Zinch getting the nerfs, finally. So with their barrier ability, both in campaign and in multiplayer, the recharge delay between when the barrier goes back up is now 30 seconds from 15. This is very welcomed. Uh, you can still cycle your units. You just have to cycle them with a longer cooldown, essentially, before you get the shield back. Arcane Search, we talked about this earlier. Um, there was an issue with them getting infinite reserves, but now it's just getting a reduction change. I, I don't know exactly how the math works out, but essentially you're going to have less Winds of Magic to work with, um, which is fine. Playing against Zinch with all their spell spam is pretty nasty. And playing as Zinch, um, this hurts you a little bit, but I don't think by that much. Warp Flame, getting a nerf. Um, slight nerf, in my opinion, uh, getting a 1% reduction to weakness to fire, and you're getting a 5-point armor reduction, which also doesn't really amount to much, so um, this is just a tiny nerf to Warp Flame. Forsaken units, Forsaken of Zinch, since they already have a barrier, unlike the other Forsaken units, they will no longer get 40% magic resistance. I have mixed feelings about this, because they're saying, essentially... If you micro the barrier correctly to absorb the spells, then you shouldn't have magic resistance. Which I guess is kind of true, but if you do lose your barrier, since barrier is getting nerfed as well with the recharge delay, then the rest of the health is getting 40% less magic resistance. So it makes them significantly weaker to magic. Um, you could use some sort of a physical attack to bring down their shield and then you're basically doing 40 percent more damage to them with your whatever magic damage you have uh, it doesn't have to be a spell uh, it can just be like a magic damage on the unit and your forsaken will die much faster with this so not sure how i feel about that uh, exalted flamers and the regular flamers are getting sort of a differentiation here. Um, basically, the exalted is going to be more range focus. It's going to get an extra 60 range, which is pretty huge, and five points of ammo. Uh, I think another key difference is one of them is a single entity and one's not. At least that's from what I remember. I mean, flamers are great units, um, just the close range. If you can get them to fire, massive damage. Um, now the exalted, which I believe is the single entity version, it's going to be slightly more specialized. Basically, you're, you're kind of saying, why do I want one uh, versus having like a bunch of them getting into position to shoot and uh, less damage per flamer, but you get a lot more with the regular one. Now, this one has at least more range and more ammo uh, to give you a reason to use them, I guess. So I think that's kind of the goal here. For multiplayer, uh, the cost of Exalted goes up by 200. Not a big change. Uh, Kids love. So they're getting sort of a faster unit response. I think they were saying the units are a little bit heavy, at least the feel of it. So Armor Kassars, Strazis, and Zargars are getting their acceleration bumped. So perhaps they will just seems to charge or get moving a little faster. Light War Sleds were doing really, really well. Um, I mean, War Sleds in general were all really strong, but there was really no reason to pick the heavy given the cost ratio. Uh, now they're reducing the armor of the light by 20 points, just so that you see a more significant boost to pick the heavy. Elemental bears. Um, I think this, since these are all multiplayer only changes, oh no, they're not, right? That's multiplayer only. This is actually across the board because they're not changing the stats separately right now. I don't know if they're ever do stat changes that are, you know, only for multiplayer versus campaign, but... At least they're just trying to do fixes across the board and then change the cost for multiplayer custom unit cost to um, make things balance there. Uh, but Elemental Bear getting a buff? Interesting. Um, I guess the main weakness is kind of huge. It gets hit by a lot of units since it can get surrounded by a lot of units. So having more dodge rate helps. 
but I think bears are really strong, especially if you play Boris. Uh, having them self-regenerate health is just insane. So it's nice to see a buff. I don't know exactly if they need it. Little Grom, not so good because it's like a single entity cannon. It's getting a slight buff to range damage, uh, both base and armor piercing. Not huge, but uh, they don't want to tweak it too much. We'll see if it gets more play rate, I guess. Kids left multiplayer only. Uh, the cost adjustment, the war sleds not only gets a you know, reduction of armor, the costs also will go up. Elemental bears are getting cheaper. Hmm. I don't know how I feel about that. Yeah, but um, they're strong. Nurgles. So this is both campaign and multiplayer changes. Exalted Plague Bear are getting one more ammo count, and they're going faster. Uh, I think this is actually a trend across the board. Yeah, Nurgle units are too slow, so Plague Bear is also going faster. Plague Drones, ammo count goes up. So basically, they're getting a little bit more range firepower. Um, Nurgle units are annoying to play against um, because of their high health and all the debuff they cause. Their lack of range was nice, but now that they're getting a little bit more range, mm, there's a lot of value on this because it's hard to kill Exalted, Plague Bearers, Nurgle. They have so much health, so they can probably fire all of these off, which I guess does present a problem. It's a nice buff. I think if you're coming from Nurgle's perspective, it's a good buff. But uh, if you're playing against them, it's kind of annoying. Plague Father, relatively little use. Let's see, he's getting more ammo count. Healing rate provided by the Nurgling Infestation ability goes up basically double. Mm, it's not bad. I mean, I, I think it's just a trend. It's just like, they're not strong, but they, they're just so healthy. It takes forever to kill them, which is just so annoying. And then Nurgle multiplier changes. Let's see what we're doing. They're doing well in range matchup. They're struggling in domination tournament environments. We're looking to increase the size. Right. There's going to be general changes to domination in terms of army size, which we'll cover later. Also reducing their cost. So we're dipping everything by roughly 150 here for the plague bearers. 150 for the exalted. Ooh, that's pretty good. And Great Unclean one now counts as a rare single entity. So I think there's like a cap to how many of these you can have. Maybe two. We'll see. I, I don't remember. We don't play much domination on the channel. So Nash, um, I don't think they're getting changed much. Right. They don't know exactly what's going to happen with them because they're changing a lot of the charging. In fact, because the mass was messed up. So perhaps with the mass fixed, They'll just do amazing. So they're just going to wait and see before they do any changes. Same thing for a multiplayer. They're happy with corn. The one change that people were clamoring for is one, the tech didn't make sense because it was getting like a trait that the flesh had already had. Now it's going to give something they don't have, um, right? Because they already had the now provide strider while also increasing their charge bonus. So right now it's going to do something for you basically. Now about multiplayer changes strictly in terms of the design. They're adding two new maps. They're changing how you get supplies. So for those who are not you know, familiar with Domination, it's a capture the flag on the map, but you're also getting supplies to call in reinforcements. Previously, the rate of supply was 16 per second, plus how much damage you are doing to the enemy in burst, which, which was kind of hard to explain. But now it's more of a comeback mechanic. So it's based on how many tickets or points you have. And if you're ahead, uh, you're not going to get a catchback mechanic. But if you're behind by a certain amount, you get more supplies, as well as the default supplies also going to increase. So basically, they're trying to make the battles a little bit larger, I guess, uh, starting with starting units. I think every army is going to get 500 more supplies for the first initial army, right? They're trying to get it to feel a little bit epic by putting more units on it. Um, first off, two maps, pretty maps. And then the change, right? How much fun initially you pick between the main army and reinforcements, now 50-50 instead of 40-60, to give you basically the initial 500 supplies to help you put more units out there in the beginning. They're also kind of hoping this will probably help Cathay out a little bit because Cathay requires a bigger army for Harmony. As I mentioned before, uh, the default supply was 16 per second. Now it's just 20 per second. There is no more supplies provided for damaging enemy units, which benefited the winning side, because you have more units on the field that stayed alive, they can do more damage, they get more supplies, 
basically you win more. There's no comeback. Now it's if you're behind by a thousand points, remember five thousand point to win. So a thousand is actually quite a lot to be behind by. You get five additional supplies per second. If you're behind by two thousand points, it's plus ten supplies per second. So you're gonna get thirty. Your opponents only get get twenty. Um, we'll see how this plays out. I think they're also curious to see how this plays out. General fixes. I like this. So what they're doing is manual targeting. So when you hit insert, right, with a siege weapon or using the alt button for the map will no longer be allowed for multiplayer battles because you can cheese it. Um, this is still allowed in single player campaign, which is great because it's really fun to do manual targeting, especially with something like Sky Junk. So it shouldn't really get punished just because it's something you can exploit in multiplayer uh, for the single player experience. So this is a nice way to do the change. In rank battle, no longer be able to load army from Demons of Chaos. Ooh. Wow, that's a pretty big change. Because they have just such a well-rounded roster, I guess. Huh. Okay. I mean, this goes with ability not working for Bellacore. Survival battles. I guess these were just a couple bugs for the survival battles. Localization fix for... Brazilian Portuguese and the no issues with this update. So as I mentioned, there is this soft lock for the final quet battle, depending on how you place your army on the marker. Um, probably not going to be a huge issue, but just something that they do know of. Of course, there's other things they don't know of, and uh, we'll see. Um, finally, before we leave this, they have... Where is it? Huh, there was a redacted area. Did I miss it? There was a takeaway. Maybe there is not, actually. Right here. This is the key statement here. And it's in the beginning, before you read all the patch notes. This is the first update for Total Warhammer 3. There are still many, many years aside, set aside to continue the growth and evaluation of the game, including new features. Blood Pack, which, you know, the... Awesome three bucks spent on getting blood and uh, heads cut off animations. Immortal Empires, which is the thing everyone's waiting for, for the huge combined map of the first three game. Redacted, which is probably the first content DLC. We'll see what it is soon. Ongoing fixes, things they still want to fix, auto resolve. We mentioned uh, they acknowledge it's not working as intended. They're going to try to fix it so you don't have to fight everything manually. Siege battles, I think this is just feedback on people not enjoying fighting so many siege battles. Although I think the new siege battles are fine. Like it pushes you to capture points. If you don't capture points, you get punished. But definitely the tower rebuild rate could be fixed or toned down a little bit because AI is just kind of cheat too much there for players to feel good about it. Unit movement, right? The responsiveness, the turns of the range unit, manual firing. So these are things they're still working on. And sync animations, which is a favorite of a lot of people. I don't care too much about it because I rarely zoom in that much in battle, but I can see the you know the charm of it. Uh, adjustments to balance the realm chaos campaign, existing and new factions, and more. So, uh, lots to look forward to in the future, and hopefully you guys enjoy this patch rundown. And I'll see you guys next time. Bye.